Hello, my name is Andy and I am the Village Idiot. I'm armed with a car and a GoPro and an unhealthy amount of time on my hands. I'm using that time to attempt to visit every civil parish in England. You're watching the East Riding of Yorkshire series. Together with the unparished city of Hull, it forms the county of the same name. There's 172 parishes here. Which one are we in today? Welcome back to the East Riding of Yorkshire, everybody, and to a place which is one of the biggest villages on the Holderness coast. It's got a main settlement and lots of other smaller ones around. It's called Roos. Here's my disclaimer for people who may be watching me for the first time. I say things as I would in my native accent and dialect. As a result, I may not pronounce things in the same way as the locals do. Remember, I'm a visitor. It's impossible to know everything. Leave me a comment, spin me a like and bash that subscribe button. Let's get to today's parish video. Are we ready for another big one? In this one, we'll be all over the place thanks to how many settlements fall within the parish boundaries of Roos. Let's start with Roos itself though. It's located on the Holderness coast, some three and a half miles away from Withensee along the B1242. A typical East Yorkshire village, it has several notable landmarks including two pubs, a church, a school and a few shops. This is the East Riding village where the de Ross family originated, a very important family in English history. In 1215, Robert de Ross was one of the 25 barons appointed under Clause 61 of the Magna Carta Agreement to monitor its observance by King John of England. Roos also has a connection to the author, Tolkien. Although he spent a lot of time in the East Riding in general, it was here in Roos where he gained the inspiration for the meeting of Beren and Luthien in his works The Cimmerillon and The Lord of the Rings, thanks to the Hemlocks at Dean's Garth. Roos has several satellite villages, namely Tunstall, Hilston and Oastwick. These include a barrage of other historical gems like a former Quaker hotbed and a beach cobbled church. There's also an octagonal tower which was built in 1750 as a lookout for Joseph Storr, the father of Rear Admiral John Storr who we met in Hamilton. So get ready folks, this one's quite the journey. Welcome to Roos and everything that comes with it. We begin our trip around the parish of Roos in the hamlet of Oastwick, situated between Fitling and Hilston. First, let's explain the curious name. During the Saxon period, Oastwick had its own thane called Host. This was later corrupted to Oast. The later addition of the suffix Wick makes this Host's farm. The Doomsday Book lists the settlement's name as Hostwick, and at that time it had a population of 45. Oastwick became important for religious reasons in the 17th and 18th centuries. This was a centre for the Quaker faith and the oldest records of Quaker activity here go back to 1654. A prominent member of the Oastwick Quaker community was Marmaduke Storr, one of the earliest converts. In 1665, Storr's house became the Quaker's monthly meeting place. By the middle of the 19th century, the meeting house was in disrepair, but the burial ground was still occasionally used by followers. Quaker history here is remembered by Oastwick's only main road, Quaker Lane. Once through Oastwick, if you cross the B1242, the main road into Roos from Oldborough, you're heading into the second settlement on our list, Hilston. Compared to Oastwick, Hilston is much more compact and consists of a couple of housing clusters, 12 in total, surrounding its church dedicated to St Margaret. 
narrow country lanes usually mean there's plenty of mud around i tell you what it's a really good job i'm not precious about my vehicle because this is the kind of thing that you can expect to happen to yours if you meet something and have to get over and out the way of something like i had to through ostwick look at this <laughs> oh well just needs a wash later doesn't it nothing a bit of soap and water can't get rid of it's only on one side of the car anyway now i've pulled up here outside the church in Hilston. Here it is, St Margaret's. This is the next thing on our list. Let's talk about this. St Margaret's Church stands at the eastern end of the village on a former road to Tunstall, which no longer exists thanks to coastal erosion. An Anglican church made of brick, this is one of the county's most modern, built as it was between 1956 and 1957. It was designed by the architect Francis Johnson to replace a former church destroyed in August 1941 by a World War II bomb. That church was built in 1861 and was the work of John Loughborough Pearson. It was a replacement in and of itself. An original church was built here in the 12th century, but didn't appear in any records until 1252. It originated as a chapel of ease to Rus. The only clues to the existence of either former church now are the Norman doorway and some 19th century stained glass. Back to the road. Hilston's one and only main street is Tower Road, a name that brings us to the other major landmark out here. Now, as grand a building as St Margaret's Church is, Hilston also has another major landmark, which is probably just a little bit on the taller side. Do you remember us talking about Admiral Store in the Humbleton episode? Well, here in Hilston, he has his very own tower. Let's see if we can find it. Admiral Storr's tower stands in a privately owned field to the north of Hilston on a small mound. This is as close as I could get to it. A fascinating structure, this has connections to Rear Admiral John Storr, the man who we spoke about in Humbleton. I zoomed in with my phone camera for a closer shot, but all I got was this shaky footage. Luckily though, I found some that's awesome. This two minute long piece of drone footage was taken two years ago by Andy Medcalf, a well-known Withensea photographer. He allowed me to use this to show you up close what the tower is like. Handily, his video also has some written snippets of information, meaning I can take a break from talking for a short while. Enjoy. And there's one more outlying settlement before we walk around Roos itself, and that is Tunstall, which is where I am standing 
right now. A very straight, long, linear village which runs between this house you can see behind me, in fact, from a little bit further back, there's a couple more houses down there, up to the church which you can see in shot there. That road off to the right takes you towards the sea, but to be honest with you in this episode, I'm not really interested in the sea because there's loads more other interesting things to see than the sea. Let's go. Tunstall is a linear settlement along the coast. We begin outside the former King's Arms pub, which dates back to the 1850s. Tunstall wasn't always this close to the North Sea. Its position on the coast has changed thanks to constant coastal erosion. It used to be linked to Hilston via this road, but drive up here now and you'll meet a dead end marked by the North Sea cliffs. A number of buildings in the village date to the early 18th century, including Town Farmhouse, Manor Farmhouse and its nearby barn. Tunstall has few amenities, but its phone box does feature a defibrillator at least. The village does have an interesting claim to fame. The Greenwich Meridian, which forms the boundary between the Earth's eastern and western hemispheres, passes through Tunstall. It makes its northernmost landfall anywhere in the world at Tunstall Beach, close to the Sandlemere Holiday Park. Let's have a quick look at the church next. This is dedicated to All Saints and it's originally of Norman construction. The modern building has had many alterations, mainly from the 13th and 14th centuries. Its tower was added in the 15th century. The church was restored in 1875 to designs by Smith and Broderick of Hull. They rebuilt much of the chancel and parts of the aisles. Fun fact, All Saints is built of an unusual material, beach cobble, the same type of rock that you would typically pick up on any UK beach. And speaking of beaches, Tunstall was the location on the Holderness coast where the sperm whale that can be seen at Burton Constable Hall washed up. Also on the beach at Tunstall were fortifications constructed during World War II. These include a minefield, a weapons pit, tank traps and several coastal pillboxes. Leaving Tunstall behind, we're now driving into Roos via a small area known as North End. This is part of Roos village, but it's separated from the main cluster by a quarter of a mile or so of open farmland. Get ready folks, it's walking time. Now despite being a northerner, and yes I do class Lincoln as being in the north, not the south, I thought I was being hard this morning by just wearing my shirt. Um, it is quite cool out here though, so I've donned the jumper for the main walk around Roos. My start point is the school, the primary school just here, which you can see in shot, uh, sort of, behind the hedge. And it's uh, also going to be my end point too. This is basically two roads, Roos. You've got a, a front street and a back street, and uh, yeah, it's a nice little circle with the church sort of in the middle. So let's go for a walk, shall we? Our route begins at the northern end of Roos on Main Street, the B1242. This runs through the northern half of the village. You can get a bus here. Like Oldborough, Roos is another village on the route of the 129, which connects Hornsey to Withensea. Roos has two pubs. Here's the Roos Arms, and this one is a traditional country local. It has B&B &B accommodation too. On the other side of the road we find a parish notice board. Tick off Roos folks, the Holderness coast is fast disappearing now. Roos has a couple of retail premises. The one and only grocery shop is Roos Village Store, which doubles as the post office. On the end of the same row is a pinkish coloured house which is a beauty salon named Pure Beauty and Skin Care. Over the road is the second pub, the Black Horse. Both this and the Roos Arms serve food and host a range of social activities. Next to the Black Horse is a combined butcher's shop and bakery, Melbourne, which has been a Roos institution for 18 years. Hodgson Lane is the road down the side of the pub, generally a residential street, save for one important building at the end. That would be a recently built doctor's surgery with its own dispensary. A village of this size certainly needs one of these. 
Okay, that's brought us to Rectory Road, which runs parallel to the main street. It's a long, straight road that runs all the way down to the church. Trust me, it's quite a walk down there. So uh, yeah, this will be a lengthy section. As we amble down Rectory Road, we'll discuss Roos's connection to the author J.R.R. Tolkien by way of one of its houses. The house in question is this old rectory. This was built in 1893 in the Queen Anne style to designs by Temple Moor. This is one of three residences in the village in which it suggested Tolkien spent some time during his many visits to Roos. Tolkien never mentioned in any of his writings where exactly he resided. He never gave a precise address of any property in the village. However, on the manuscript of the Horns of Ulmo, he wrote that it was rewritten in a lonely house near Roos. It could have been Roos Hall, a 40-roomed mansion owned by the Dickinson family. Many of its rooms were let out to various people. The hall burned down in 1937. Its remains were then demolished and Elm Farm, which still exists, was built on the site. I guess nobody will ever know the exact location of Tolkien's lonely house, but it's certainly a thought-provoking idea. It was here in Roos where Tolkien got the inspiration for the meeting of Beren and Luthien, thanks to the Hemlocks at Dents Garth. Okay, and after walking down Rectory Road for what seems like an eternity past lots of beautiful houses, we are then at the Church of All Saints, which you can see the entrance to behind me right here. This extends a warm, oh dear, that's a bit wonky, isn't it? <laughs> we extend a warm welcome to everyone who visits our beautiful Grade 1 listed church, parts of which date from the 13th century. Fabulous. Let's go in and have a look. All Saints Church is a Grade 1 listed building and stands at the foot of Rectory Road, almost on its own, on a small mound. It stands next to a moated site, that of the medieval Roos Castle, built by Baron de Ross, one of the signatories of the Magna Carta in 1215. It has a 13th century nave, a 14th century chancel, and its west tower, built in 1447, houses eight bells. Notable features include a vestry with a spiral staircase leading to a turret tower, which extends above the roof parapet. It has strong links with the Sykes family of Sledmere. Members of the Sykes family are buried in the crypt, accessed by steps outside the building. Arguably, the churchyard is as important as the church here. In January, it's not uncommon to see this covered in a carpet of snowdrops. It has a modern section, as well as a much older Victorian part, lined with a distinctive avenue of yew trees. You can follow a path all the way through it to South End Road. On the right, Tedder Hill Wind Farm between Roos and Rimswell can be seen. OK, so what this footpath does, effectively, is it takes you back onto the main street um, via a, a little sort of side road, effectively. Uh, and uh, we're going to walk straight up the main street again until we reach a, a right turn. And then at that point, we'll be heading towards the playing field and back towards the school where we started. Here's a bit more about the de Ross family. The de Ross family originally came from Roos, thereby giving it its name. Born in 1182, Sir Robert de Ross was the son and heir of Everard de Ross. He was a supporter of the Knights Templar and a major benefactor of Revo Abbey, Newminster Abbey and Kirkham Priory. He was primarily an Anglo-Norman soldier and administrator, but more importantly, one of the 25 barons appointed by King John of England to monitor the observance of the Magna Carta Agreement under Clause 61 of the famous document signed in 1215. In 1225, he was one of the witnesses to the reissue of the Magna Carta, and by the end of 1226 had entered a monastic order, possibly the Knights Templar. He died a year later in 1227 and was buried in the Temple Church in London. The arms of Robert de Ross, which you can see on your screens right now, is still used today by the Parish Council as its logo.
We're now on South End Road, which is the side street that runs back to the B1242. There are some interesting landmarks on this street. However, most of them are at the other end. This southern portion of the street is lined with dwellings of all ages and sizes. Despite being mostly built up, it feels very spacious with wide roadside and corner verges at entries into some developments. The overall character in this part of the village is fabulous. It's classic East Riding and not one single building is obtrusive. Soon one of the old schoolhouses comes into view. There were once four schools in Rus, nowadays there's only one. Just beyond that is the Memorial Institute, a highly valued village asset built in 1922. It was built in memory of those lost in World War I. The gates list all of the men lost in conflict as well as those who served and returned. There's a small plaque too for those lost in World War II. A few more steps and we're back to Main Street on a bend in the B1242 with the Black Horse pub directly ahead of us. Okay, now we're making that right turn down Pilmar Lane. This will take us towards the playing field in a nice neat little loop which will end up back at the school. So one last section to go around this really large parish of the East Riding of Yorkshire. Pilmar Lane is a continuation of the B1242 as it bends its way from Roos out towards Waxholm and the town of Withensee. This road was once the site of another school. It was built in 1872, reorganising education in Roos into a single building. It no longer stands and is now wholly residential. Off the main road is a little spur which provides us with a link to the current school. Between the two is the playing field, which for over 30 years has been managed by the Roos Playing Field Association. It has this small playground and provides a space for local car boot sales. Its pavilion is occasionally used for social and private functions. Sports-wise, the field is used by both a cricket club and a football club. Many other groups use it too, such as a local aero club. And finally, we return to Roos Primary School, which opened in 1980, catering for 73 pupils. It now has just over 120 pupils on roll. And that's been Roos, one of the most complicated and challenging parishes to cover in the East Riding. It's a fantastic village with a lot of history, probably far more than I can cover, to be honest. After this, we need a small one, don't we? Luckily, the next one down the coast will do us. See you there next week. Thanks for watching this video folks don't forget to like this episode if you haven't already it really makes a difference with youtube if you're new here subscribe to the channel for more videos like this and give us a share too if you've got friends who'd like it you can find all the links to my social media accounts below as well as my buy me a coffee page where you can donate to the channel also if you've enjoyed this episode have a look at some more videos in this series until next time i've been andy also known as the village idiot and i'm out <laughs>